Welcome to the Health Headliner Podcast by Tudu Digital. Our content is informational only and not medical advice. Please consult your provider. Now let's dive into today's headlines. Have you ever noticed how different foods, you know, even the supposedly healthy ones like a potato or maybe bowl of rice, seem to affect your energy levels completely differently than, say, someone else's. Oh, absolutely. You eat the same meal as a friend and you feel great, they feel sluggish, or maybe the other way around. It's a, it's a really common thing people notice. Right. And for ages, it feels like we haven't quite known the biological why. Why do our bodies handle carbs so differently? Exactly. It's been a bit of a puzzle. But today, we're actually going to dig into some uh, really fascinating new research that shed some light on this. Okay, I'm intrigued. What's the core idea? Well, it seems your personal blood sugar response to food, it isn't just about, like, the food's nutritional facts. Yeah. It's deeply tied to the specific details of your own metabolic health, your individual biology. Ah, so it's not just the potato. It's your body yeah. plus the potato. Precisely. And we're basing this deep dive on a recent Health News article covering the research, and more importantly, on the detailed scientific paper itself. It was published in Nature Medicine uh, from researchers primarily at Stanford Medicine. Got it. So our mission today is to unpack that study, pull out the key findings, understand this um, surprising level of difference between people's blood sugar responses and sort of explore what it could mean for you and maybe the future of personalized nutrition. Yeah, we want to help you understand why that diet that works wonders for your neighbor might just not click for you, looking at these you know, deeper biological factors. Okay, let's dive in then. The study itself, what was the main question the Stanford researchers were trying to answer? Fundamentally, they wanted to get at the reason behind those different blood sugar responses to the same carb-heavy foods. Their thinking was, this isn't just random chance. It's probably linked to someone's underlying metabolic health. Maybe they're um, unique molecular profile. Makes sense. So how did they set it up? Who participated? They recruited 55 individuals. Now, these people didn't have a prior diagnosis of type 2 diabetes when they joined. Okay. But, and this is really important, when they did thorough metabolic testing as part of the study, they found that 26 of them, so just under half, actually met the criteria for pre-diabetes. Wow, nearly half. Yeah. And that percentage actually lines up pretty well with estimates for the U.S. population. You know, that figure that about one in three adults has prediabetes and many don't even know it. So the group was quite representative in that sense. Right. So it included people across the spectrum of metabolic health, not just super healthy individuals. What about demographics? They had a mix. Variety in age, body mass index, sex, and participants identified as European, Asian, Hispanic, and also mixed Asian-European backgrounds. Good range. And how did they actually measure the blood sugar responses? They used continuous glucose monitors, or CGMs. Participants wore these little sensors, usually on the arm, throughout the study. Ah, so they got constant, real-time blood sugar data, not just finger pricks. Exactly. It gives you a much more detailed picture of the fluctuations, the peaks, the valleys, everything that happens after you eat. Okay. so. What did they have these folks eat? So after fasting overnight, usually 10 to 12 hours, participants ate standardized meals. Each meal provided exactly 50 grams of carbohydrates. Standardized, so everyone got the same test food in the same amount. What kinds of foods? They tested seven different ones. Jasmine rice, buttermilk bread, shredded potatoes specifically prepared, we'll get to that, racaroni pasta, canned black beans, grapes, and a mixed berry blend. A good mix of starches and sugars. Right. And they had each participant eat each food twice on separate days to check for consistency in their individual responses. Yeah. And they tracked the blood sugar using the CGMs for three hours after each meal. Smart to do it twice. Now, you mentioned something about mitigators earlier. What was that about? Yeah, that was another part of the study. In separate tests, they wanted to see if eating something else just before the carbs could change the blood sugar spike. Like a nutritional strategy? Exactly. So some participants ate a portion of fiber. It came from pea fiber powder or protein, from boiled egg whites, or fat, uh, from creme fraiche, about 10 minutes before they ate the standard jasmine rice meal. Okay, testing that common advice about eating protein or fiber first. Right, seeing if that preloading actually blunted the spike from the rice. And besides the CGM data from the food tests, what other information did they collect on these participants? You mentioned their molecular profile. Oh yeah, they went really deep here. Participants had comprehensive metabolic tests done. These included like 
the gold standard methods for assessing insulin resistance. That's when your cells don't respond well to insulin, right? So sugar hangs around in the blood longer. Exactly. And also beta cell function. That's about how well the cells in your pancreas, the ones that actually make the insulin, are working. Okay. And then they did what's called multi-omics profiling. It sounds complex, but it basically means looking at a whole bunch of different biological molecules all at once. Like what kind of molecules? Things like levels of fats in the blood, triglycerides, fatty acids, various small molecules called metabolites, different proteins. And they even looked at the composition of the gut microbiome, you know, the bacteria in their gut, using blood and stool samples. Wow. So CGM data, detailed metabolic tests, multi-omics, they gathered a ton of information on each person. They really did, trying to build a complete picture. So with all that data, what was the big overarching finding? The absolute core finding was the sheer variability. People's blood glucose responses to the exact same 50 grams of carbs from the same food were just wildly different from person to person. So it confirmed that initial observation we talked about. Confirmed it robustly. But crucially, it wasn't random variation. These different patterns, who spiked high on what, were strongly associated with those underlying metabolic conditions they measured, particularly insulin resistance and beta cell function. Okay, so the variability is real, and it's linked to your underlying health. Let's dig into that variability more. Did any food cause the biggest spike on average? Yes. On average, looking across all 55 participants, jasmine rice produced the highest blood sugar peak. Okay, rice was the biggest hitter overall. But the key finding was about individual differences, right? Exactly. That average hides the really interesting part. Even though rice was high for many, the specific food that caused the highest spike varied a lot between individuals. So it wasn't just rice for everyone. Not at all. As one of the lead researchers, Dr. Yu Wu, was quoted saying, starchy foods were not equal. There was a lot of individual variability in which foods produced the highest glucose spike. So you had some people who were definite potato spikers, others whose biggest peak came from grapes, some from bread. It was very personalized. Fascinating. And that's where they linked it back to metabolic health. The specific food you spiked most on told them something about your body. That's the absolute crux of it, yes. They found significant links between which food caused your personal biggest spike and your specific metabolic profile. Okay, tell me more. What about those potato spikers or pasta spikers? What was going on with them metabolically? The individuals who spiked highest after eating potatoes or pasta, their glucose peaks for those foods were significantly higher compared to people who were insulin sensitive or had normal beta cell function. These potato and pasta spikers tended to be the ones with underlying insulin resistance or some degree of beta cell dysfunction. So if your body's insulin system isn't working optimally, Potatoes and pasta seem particularly tricky. That's what the data suggests. And it might relate to the type of starch. They noted the potatoes were cooked and cooled, which increases something called resistant starch. And pasta generally contains slowly digestible starch. Hmm, maybe those types require a more robust insulin response. That's a plausible hypothesis. If your system is already struggling, those specific carbs might overwhelm it more easily. They also found potato spikers tended to have higher levels of certain fats in their blood, like triglycerides and fatty acids, which often go hand in hand with insulin resistance. Okay, that connection makes sense. What about the grape spikers? Were they insulin resistant too? No, and this is really interesting. It was the opposite. The participants for whom grapes caused the highest spike were generally more insulin sensitive. Whoa. Okay, so spiking on fruit sugar was linked to better metabolic health in this context. In this study, yes. It really underscores that different carbohydrates, like the starches and potatoes versus the sugars and grapes, are handled differently by the body, and how they're handled depends heavily on your underlying metabolic state. Were there links for the other foods too, like bread or beans? Yes, they found some of the connections. Bread spikers, for instance, tended to have higher blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, and also higher levels of a specific molecule, a metabolite called N1-methylenosine. That metabolite has been linked in other studies to cardiovascular risk. Mm, another piece of the puzzle. And spikes after eating black beans were associated with certain metabolic pathways and differences in how individuals process an amino acid called histidine. So yeah, distinct patterns emerged for different foods. It really paints a picture of individuality. It's not just carbs are bad or carbs are good. It's which carbs and for whom. Precisely. And this led them to propose a potentially very practical idea like a simple way to gauge metabolic health. What was that? Well, 
Since the response to potatoes seemed to strongly reflect insulin resistance, while the response to grapes was more linked to insulin sensitivity, or at least consistent in a different way, they suggested that comparing someone's individual glucose response to potatoes versus their response to grapes might actually serve as a simple real-world indicator, maybe even a future biomarker for insulin resistance. Like a potato-grape ratio test. You eat both, track your spikes, and the difference tells you something. Kind of, yeah. It's a concept at this stage, not a clinical test yet. But Dr. Tracy McLaughlin, another lead researcher, highlighted how useful something like this could be. Why is that? Because, as she pointed out, insulin resistance is something we can often improve with lifestyle changes or medication, which can lower the risk of developing full-blown diabetes. But right now, diagnosing it easily in the doctor's office isn't straightforward. It often takes more involved tests. Ah, so a simpler food-based test could make screening much easier. Potentially, yes. It could help identify people at higher risk much earlier when interventions might be most effective. It's a very promising idea stemming from these findings. Definitely something to watch. Now, let's go back to those mitigator tests. The fiber, protein, or fat eaten before the rice. Did that common advice actually hold up in this study? Did it lower the spike? Generally speaking, yes. Eating the fiber or the protein about 10 minutes before the rice did tend to result in a lower overall blood sugar spike compared to eating the rice by itself. And the fat? The fat, the creme fraiche, didn't significantly lower the peak height of the spike as much, but it did tend to delay when the peak occurred, so it shifted the curve a bit. Okay, so there is some scientific basis for that eat your salad first idea? There is. But, and this is a really crucial but from this study, that beneficial effect, the mitigation, was significantly less pronounced, sometimes almost non-existent, in the participants who had underlying insulin resistance or beta cell dysfunction. Wait, really? So the trick works better if you're already metabolically healthy? That's exactly what the data showed. The mitigation effect primarily helped those who were already insulin sensitive. For those whose systems were already struggling with insulin, eating the fiber or protein first didn't provide nearly the same buffering effect against the rice spike. Wow. That completely changes how you think about that advice. It's not a universal fix. It adds a massive layer of personalization. The researchers hypothesize that maybe the benefits of that preloading strategy rely, at least partly, on interacting with a normally functioning insulin system. If your insulin response is already impaired, that little bit of fiber or protein beforehand might not be enough to make a big difference. So when you hear advice like uh, Dr. Michael Snyder, one of the senior authors, put it, eat your salad or hamburger before your french fries. Right, it's relatable advice. But this study suggests the effectiveness of that strategy might really depend on your individual metabolic state. It works well for some, maybe not so much for others. That is a huge insight. It really underscores why broad, one-size-fits-all dietary guidelines might not be optimal for managing blood sugar in everyone. Exactly. It strongly supports the move away from lumping everyone together. Dr. Snyder also commented on this, saying something like, Right now, the American Diabetes Association dietary guidelines do not work that well because they lump everyone together. Because the study shows there are different subtypes even within prediabetes. Precisely. He suggested, based on this work, that not only are there subtypes within prediabetes, but also that your subtype could determine the foods you should and should not eat. It really points towards needing more personalized prevention and treatment strategies. So using tools like maybe CGMs more widely combined with understanding someone's specific metabolic profile. Yes, that seems to be the direction this research points. You could potentially figure out someone's specific carb response type and then tailor food recommendations based on their unique biology, not just generic rules. It's really compelling, but like all research, we should touch on the limitations too. What are the caveats here? Definitely. Firstly, while the findings are insightful, it was still a relatively small study, 55 participants. You always need larger studies to confirm these kinds of patterns. Right. And what about the demographics again? While they had some diversity, they acknowledged there weren't enough participants from various specific racial or ethnic backgrounds to draw really firm conclusions about potential race-specific differences in these responses. They did note um, that Asian participants seemed more likely to be rice spikers, which fits with some other observations but needs more research. Okay, and the study focused on the immediate responses, right? Not long-term health. Correct. It was fantastic at identifying these detailed, short-term associations linking specific food spikes to metabolic states and molecules right now. It wasn't designed to follow people for years to see if personalized advice 
based on this actually prevents diabetes or heart disease long term. That's the next step, requiring big clinical trials. And the food preparation was quite specific too. Yes, that's another point. They used, for example, cooked and cooled potatoes, which changes the starch. Results might differ with freshly cooked potatoes or potatoes mashed with butter or, you know, pasta with sauce. Real world meals are more complex. Exactly. Yeah. And they only tested the mitigators, the fiber, protein, fat before the rice meal. Would it work the same before bread or pasta? Mm -hmm. You don't know from this study. Also, they asked people to limit activity after eating, but they didn't formally track physical activity, which definitely impacts blood sugar. All good points to keep in mind. So let's wrap this up. If you had to boil it down, what's the single biggest message for our listeners from this deep dive? I think the core message is that your body's reaction to carbohydrates is deeply, fundamentally personal. It's not just about the label on the food package. It's about the intricate dance between that food and your unique metabolic machinery, especially how sensitive you are to insulin and how well your pancreas is doing its job. Eating for metabolic health really seems to require an individual lens. It truly emphasizes the personalized, impersonalized nutrition. It really does. And that brings us to maybe a final thought to leave people with, thinking about the future. Yeah, I mean, just consider this. What if, down the road, routine metabolic checkups, maybe combined with accessible tech like CGMs, could actually pinpoint for you which specific carbohydrates your body handles well and which ones tend to cause trouble for your system. Moving beyond guessing or following generic advice. Exactly. Imagine getting dietary guidance truly tailored to your unique biological blueprint, designed to support your specific metabolic health needs. That's the kind of exciting future that research like this opens the door to. A future where eating right really means eating right for your own body. It's a powerful idea. Definitely. And it's driven by this kind of science that helps us understand those unique individual responses at a much deeper biological level. It's an exciting time for this field. Thanks for tuning in to the Health Headliner podcast by To Do Digital. Like and subscribe for more health news and breakthroughs. Stay healthy and informed. See you next time.